This is Internet Marketing. Hello and welcome to the show where we give you the lowdown, the inside information and the word from the experts to help you use the internet as part of your marketing machine. Internet marketing is brought to you by Site Visibility at sitevisibility.co.uk. And in episode 57, we have an interview with best-selling author Seth Godin, plus entrepreneur and author of the four-hour work week, Tim Ferriss. Enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Internet Marketing. I am with Mr. Kelvin Newman. Bonjour, as they say in France. Hello, Kelvin. Um, How are you doing, Andy? All right? I'm very, very well. Yes, indeed. And we've got a fantastic show today, haven't we? Uh, two big-time interviews. Uh, first of all, Seth Godin. And um, secondly, Mr. Tim Ferriss. They will be coming up very, very shortly. But first, just a couple of um, sort of admin points uh, to, to, to go through. I mean, a few of the, uh, the more observant ones have probably noticed a change in the branding of our podcast this month. Yeah, we've um, changed all the mentions on the podcast of AI Digital to Site Visibility. Now, why is this, Kelvin? Basically, Site Visibility um, is the trading name of AI Digital, which is the company um, Helen and I work for. Um, other than the podcast, no one really knows about AI Digital, so it seemed crazy to keep promoting the podcast as being produced by AI Digital when that's a company that only exists because it owns Site Visibility. Yeah. So, as you all know, Site Visibility is who I work for. It's where the blog is, where we put all the show notes up and the like. So, it just made sense to change that over, really. Fantastic. Okay. So, basically, in a nutshell, AI Digital is like the umbrella company that owns Site Visibility. Is that, is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah. 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 That's a, a good way of explaining it. And, and in terms of the show itself, nothing's going to change, but it might have a slightly different name in iTunes or your, you know, whatever you use to listen to your podcast, but it's still the same old me, Andy, Dan yeah. and Helen doing the show. So, no big changes there. And apologies from Daniel. Daniel couldn't make it today. He's got the lurgy. A few of us, a few of us Brits, have got this weird um, lurgy going around at the moment. And I've just spoken to Dan, and he's uh, he's not too well at the moment, so he he gives us apologies. Right, there is a survey, isn't there, Kelvin? Yeah. So, well, as we're moving into twenty ten, we got um, me and me and Andy got some real big plans for what we'd like to do with the podcast. We know from the feedback we get from you guys just how much you enjoy it. We really want to try and make it better over the next um, twelve months or so. So, there's some big plans we're working on behind the scenes, which we'll start to reveal over the next couple of months. But before we do that, there's you know we always recommend on the show trying to understand what whenever you're doing any marketing, what your audience thinks. So, um, with that in mind, um, we've put together a quick survey that we'd love it if people could um, fill in. Um, all simple questions, really, in terms of the subjects you'd most like to hear us cover, people you'd most like us to uh, hear us interview, uh, and just kind of to make sure that these ideas we're working on for the future are stuff that you're interested in. Um, we've got to incentivise you all to um, have a go and fill in the um, survey. We've got a couple of prizes. Um, I'm working on those now, but we've definitely got a copy of Seth Godin, who we're interviewing later's latest books up for grabs for a couple of people, and the same for Tim Ferriss. And we'll probably bundle in a few other bits and pieces as well in terms of some of the books and um, tools that we really like. Um, so there's some good prizes up for grabs for just telling us what you think of the show, really. You know, it reminds me a little bit of the Gadget Show, Kelvin. You know, have you ever mm. watched the Gadget Show where they have that oh, five I'm million prizes? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, not, we've not quite, you know, got the company toy and everything that they give away with that. But, <laughs> it takes you know, about three minutes to go through the list. <laughs> but it should at least be a good bundle for whoever, ent- you know, whoever enters and wins. And, you know, yeah. plus just for giving us the survey information, it would be really, really appreciative of it. So um, that's going to be up and it will be by the time the show is live at internetmarketingpodcast.org forward slash survey and just to say as always if ever you're looking for the show notes or anything like that or previous episodes you can get to the archive and all those kind of things at internetmarketingpodcast.org so kelvin is the um the blog the the website now up for the podcast internetmarketing.org already um yeah essentially how that works is that redirects to an area of the site visibility site but um unlike how it used to run before it's got its own sort of header its own sort of image you can get to all the archive and all the previous episodes there so it's not a set completely separate freestanding website but if you end up at internetmarketingpodcast.org you'll know that you're there now so um we're going to make sure that that's nice and easy to understand and really practical in finding the old archive shows and the like and it's i also think it's worth people having a look anyway because on the um thread posts we do where we 
produce the podcast, we get quite a lot of comments from listeners asking follow-up questions and the like. I know that the last episode we did before Christmas, there's a nice little discussion going on there with some people suggesting some other tools they'd like or um, recommendations for how to find similar tools and that. So I think that's just a nice little extra way for people listening to the podcast, if they are at their desk, to have a look and um, find out a bit more about you know the show and what the, what the listeners think as well. Because you guys, I know, know your mustard as well. So you've got as much to add to the, the conversation as we do. Fantastic. So that's internetmarketing.org is a place to go. Internetmarketingpodcast.org. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Internetmarketingpodcast.org. Do we need the www or does it, does um, it not care? It doesn't matter. It's, um, you can do it however you like, but I'm, I'm being fashionable and without the www, but it doesn't really matter. You can do it however you like. <laughs> It'll get there. Yeah, that's a new trend, isn't it? Without the www. Well, that's, that's a lot of wasted Ws, you know. That's it is. a lot of... And especially when you're recording a podcast, W's are a nice one to make it clip, which I do a lot when I talk too closely to the microphone. So that's why I avoid them. <laughs> okay, then without further ado, let's get on with these these smashing interviews. Tell us a little bit about um, the Seth Godin. Give us a bit in, a quick intro into the Seth Godin interview. I know we've uh, talked a bit about Seth Godin a lot in the podcast over the, the previous episode, so people will probably be familiar with him via that if they're not already. But Seth Godin is the most respected um, marketing author um, in the world. He's put out dozens of books. Some of the most famous ones are Purple Cow um, and he's Permission Marketing and Tribes. And there's, there's dozens of them that he's put out. He, he does them really quickly and really high quality books. The Dip is another one I recommend really highly. And we've on the uh, blog we're, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to do some posts about the best Seth Godin books. But he is all of them. Well, a good number of them are New York Times bestseller books. And generally, I can't recommend his writing enough. But he's got a new book coming out, um, which comes out coinciding with the launch of the podcast, actually called Lynchpin. And it's a really interesting book. And we talked to him about various topics on that book that he covers. But I think it's particularly interesting because it talks about how as one person within a company, you can make yourself indispensable. And in the kind of economic climate that we're working on, you know, working in at the moment, for anyone who's working for their own company, that, you know, working for another company, I think that's really important. But it's also a really good book if you're working for yourself because it talks about kind of how to produce excellent companies that market themselves. Mm. So, you know, some really interesting stuff and a really interesting book. And, you know, he was really you know, giving in the interview and shared quite a lot of us that I found really interesting and hopefully the listeners will as well. Fantastic. Well, without further ado, let's listen to that interview with Seth Godin. Enjoy. So your new book is called Lynchpin. Um, so what is a lynchpin and how do you go about becoming one? Well, in real life, a linchpin is a little tiny piece on your car that holds the wheel to the axle. Mm. Uh, it doesn't cost more than 39 cents, but if it falls off, your car can't drive. And what I'm referencing in the book is the idea that the revolution that we call the Internet mm -hmm. has transformed our economy far more than just Amazon, Dakota, UK or something. Yeah. It is a significant shift in the dynamic of what it is to be at work. And it's, I think, the first significant shift since Adam Smith and Karl Marx talked about there being two mm -hmm. kinds of people. Uh, what I am arguing in the book as actively and straightforwardly as I can, is that there is now a third kind of person. There used to be workers and factory owners. Mm -hmm. The third kind of person is someone who owns their own factory. And by that I mean you've got a laptop, you've got access to the Internet, you have everything that you need to initiate whatever change and generate whatever income it is that you seek if you are willing to do it. And this is hard for a lot of people because we've been brainwashed for 200 years to follow instructions, wait to do what we're told, and the internet doesn't reward that. And so that we're in an economy now where people doing average work and following a manual are being hammered, where the middle class is disappearing, where it's so easy to outsource just about anything to a computer or to a cheaper person somewhere else, I think the only happy outcome is for us to become linchpins, people they can't live without, people doing unique, original, generous work that matters. And so a linchpin then, to a certain extent, is kind of one of the lines you use in the book, it isn't really a cog in a machine. Does, is there a limit to the number of linchpins, or you know, do there still need to be those people acting as the cogs in the system? Well, I sure hope we get to the point where there's a surplus of people doing important work we can't live without, but I'm yeah. not op 
I'm not optimistic that's going to happen anytime soon. You know, the opportunity, as we saw in the way the Internet has developed, is you can use as a, an excuse or a stalling mechanism, well, somebody has to keep the machine running. But yeah. while you were doing that, Jeff Bezos and, and Sergey Brin and uh, Pierre Omidyar were inventing the future, and they all did it with basically no cash, um, and they all did it because they saw a way to create something people couldn't live without. Internet marketing, for me, has divided into two camps. There are the fast followers, the copycats, the scam artists, the people who are trying to do it a little cheaper mm -hmm. by following behind the originals, and then there's people who are carving a new future. And when we look back just 10 years ago at how primitive the Internet was, try to imagine 10 years from now what it's going to look like. The fact is, if you start something today, something that's important, it's going to take three or four years for it to catch on. So you've got to be prepared to jump that much farther ahead. Mm. And you talk about those people who are, you know, genuinely creating something really valuable as being artists. You know, you use that in a slightly wider sense than maybe people might do in the past. So you say, like, Craig from Craigslist as an artist for creating that website that kind of re, you know, changed... Um, the world of classified ads and Jonathan I for deciding, um, designing the iPod as an artist. How can we go about being a bit more artistic in that sense in our day-to-day in our -day life without kind of going out completely on our own, as it were? Well, to be clear, what I'm saying is you don't need oil paint to do art. You don't need mm. marble to do art. Art is creating change directly to another human being by making a connection, by being honest, by being genuine. And here's the thing. Uh, what we need are people who are willing to do two things, uh, be criticized and fail. Artists are criticized every day. They fail every day. Picasso, you know, 90% of his paintings are forgettable. No one's ever heard of them. He failed a lot. And critics make a living criticizing books, paintings, and movies. You need to do the kind of work that people on Twitter or in your comment field or wherever are going to criticize. It'll never work. It's an albatross. You're going to be stuck with it. How dare you? And you can do that while having a day job. You know, there are people you work with. Mm. There are people in your industry who aren't running a company but are still doing work that makes a difference. Mm. And often you can do that work quite well with a boss and a boss's boss and a, and a a system at your disposal. The challenge, you know, Jonathan Ive is not running Apple, he just works there. Mm. The challenge is to be willing to do it. And the fear that you're going to get laid off, that you're going to get yelled at, that you're going to get laughed at is what shuts us down. Mm. And it's that that's what people need to conquer then to really be an artist is to be prepared that, you know, sometimes not everything's going to work all the time. But if you're not taking those risks, you're never quite going to get there. Yeah, actually, I wouldn't even say be prepared, I would say mm. be eager. You know, when you are criticized, it's a symptom that you're doing art. Brilliant. And another one which kind of fits into that quite nicely is um, you talk about the distinction between uh, everyone can appreciate the value of, of physical labor. You know, so if someone goes and builds a house, you can see the, you know, the effort that they've put in and the value there. But people kind of undervalue emotional labor. Um, so how do you sort of define of emotional labor and why do you say it's so important, really? Well, I was talking to a group last week, and they said, you know, some of us are introverts, and we just don't feel like getting up and giving a speech. And it would be hard for me to imagine a convention of ditch diggers where people say, well, how can I make a living as a ditch digger? I don't feel like digging a ditch today. You know, when it's physical labor, no one expects that you feel like it. Yeah. You do it because it's your job. And emotional labor is the act of presenting yourself as a human being even if you don't feel like it. It's the act of giving a speech even though you're scared. The act of uh, writing a blog post even though you're afraid that some people will misunderstand it. Those are things we overcome every day when we have to do physical labor. And my argument is that emotional labor is valued far more highly today than physical labor was ever valued. And have you ever been struck with that fear, um, Seth, when you, you've been producing your work, that you've been concerned that there might be a, a, a negative feedback? Or is that kind of something that you kind of, you've got that eagerness to, 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 to embrace the, the, the fact that people might not necessarily get it straight away, but you know, maybe in two or three years' time they'll appreciate the, the kind of complexity behind the idea and what you were trying to achieve? Well, every single morning between 5 and 6 a.m., one of my blog posts go live. Mm. And through sheer determination, I have a fair number of people who read my blog, and there is real fear that I blew it, that 
this post really won't work. Or what's happened lately is real fear that it isn't worthy of the platform that I have now. Mm. Real fear that I've wasted a day's post by talking about something trivial. So the question is not is fear a good thing or a bad thing? Because we would all be dead if it weren't for fear, mm. fear of crossing the street, fear of jumping out of a building. It's what are you going to do with the fear? And mm. what I've figured out how to do is turn the fear into the very thing that motivates me to do tomorrow's blog post. Mm. And if you're going to try to run from the fear, you will be unable to do emotional labor. Mm. No, 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 that sounds brilliant. I mean, another thing, that because talking about your blog and the amount of content that you give away there and, and you know the, the work you do with squid do and the like there in terms of some of the content that you and your team have produced there you give quite a lot away for free there and you're talking um in linchpin about the there's a cultural power in being prepared to give stuff away for free um how do you sit on the kind of freemium um debate you know the kind of you get give you know online you give stuff away for free but then you charge for the stuff that's got the real value what what's your viewpoint on on how that should shape up for particularly digital publishers i suppose well um you know when jackson pollock puts a painting in a museum people don't say but jackson all these people are going to be able to walk through the museum of modern art and you're not going to make any money from the yeah. seeing painting you know th- that the the act of people seeing your digital work is generous on your part but it's also a gift from the viewer they are willing to trade their attention for a look at what you did and i every day am astonishingly grateful that people are willing to spend a minute or five minutes thinking about what i've done so from my point of view it's a fair trade the freemium Mm. model uh... falls apart when the thing you are selling is totally digital in which case it's going to push itself to free Mm. Uh, or when the thing you're selling isn't worth so much you think it's worth a lot because you need to make a living but the person who's buying it can live without it and so back to the idea of a linchpin is someone you can't live without what people are able to sell in the digital publishing realm is not a hundred page pdf i don't think that there's a way to do that Mm. in the long i think the way you win in the long run is by selling bespoke stuff custom stuff uh consulting directly and you sell by giving people first looks instant stuff Mm. bloomberg is a multi-billion dollar company the information they sell is free online 30 minutes after they put it on their machine but that 30 minute or 15 minute head start is what people are Mm. paying fifteen hundred dollars a month for so your challenge if you're uh, trying to be a digital publisher is not i think to figure out how to interrupt your free readers often enough that they'll finally give up and pay you 10 bucks. I think you win by having something scarce, whether it's a printed thing or a speech or an hour of coaching um, that people are demanding to pay for, or you win by offering a small group of people that first five minute, 10 minute head start that in their line of work is worth paying for. The mistake that most internet marketers make is they're selfish. They think about what they need Mm -hmm. as opposed to what the user will gladly pay for. I mean, yeah, I think that that's one one person particularly who I know you've got a relationship, Hugh McLeod, with Gaping Void. Um, he, I think he's been really clever with that. that he's kind of, you know, he puts all his, you know, all, all his art up there on the site, and you can do whatever you want with it. But if you want the, you know, the social object, the actual real, the real piece, you know, that's there's some value there in that. That's got a value, and he seems to be doing really well off the back of that. Because I saw your, you know, the collaboration on the, the the purple cow side of things, and I think you know he's definitely someone who I've been impressed with how how he's gone about that kind of challenge. Oh, and he's such a poster child because the generosity is legitimate and real. He is not generous because he's manipulating the world. He's just generous. He is a poster child because Hugh set out to do this with no connections and no money. I didn't know him before he started, neither do the other people he worked with know him. Uh, and so here's somebody who with nothing but talent, emotional labor, uh, and effort has created a six-figure, maybe a seven-figure income by giving away ideas, having them seen by a lot of people, and then selling souvenirs of those ideas. None of it would work if he wasn't brilliant. And that's what holds people back because they say to themselves, well, I'm not brilliant. All I did was follow instructions in school. Mm. So, so many of the people who are succeeding today did poorly in school. And the reason we did poorly in school is we're not good at following instructions. Mm. And so like you then, is there anyone in particular that, you know, really is kind of on your hit list of, okay, I, I really 
appreciate and value what they've got to say on on subjects in terms of some of the people that you you really look to for inspiration and advice online well i i think that it's a very long list and a, a little bit ago i did a book mm. called an ebook called what matters now yeah that you you can find by googling and i i asked 70 of those cool people to contribute but i'll just pick you know a guy like steve pressfield mm. steve wrote a, a book called the war of art which is is really important, and I suggest everyone go out and buy it. It's a short little book. It's 140 pages long, and it's about the resistance, the voice in your head that holds you back. And this is not Steve's core work. His core work is a screenwriter and writer of historical war novels. But he's now blogging. His blog posts are really good. They're worth reading. Every time he does that, his tribe gets bigger. He connects the members of the tribe. The members of the tribe do two things. They buy more books, and they bring other people into the tribe. And over time, drip, 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 he's not going to have a bestseller. What he's going to have is a, is, is, a, is a body of work and a group of people who admire the work and want to connect with each other. And that's how you do it. It's not about pop-up windows and tricking people on Twitter and call to action. It's about genuine connection with human beings. Mm. And, I mean... You know, me and the other members of the IMPC t- um, team are, you know, a big fan of yours. And, betwi- you know, I've read about s- sort of six or seven of your books. And one thing I really like about them, you know, above and beyond the content is the way you kind of communicate it and kind of quite a, you know, you've got kind of a brevity to your style. And, you know, you kind of allow the ideas to be expressed quite simply. But there's a real power in that. Um, I know that's something personally I think that I would like to do more of, you know, in my work and, you know, try and get ideas across simply. Is there any tips you've got for the the listeners in terms of how they can kind of get these, you know, sometimes really quite complex ideas across in kind of a, a fairly easy way to understand that can reach, you know, a, a wide audience. Well, I'll give you two. The first one is I write like I talk. And I think if people were more willing to write like they talk, it would be easier for all of us. No one ever says, I have trouble talking. I have trouble sitting one-on-one with someone and explaining myself. We're all good at that. Mm-hmm. So just do that. And the second thing is I vacillate between trying to please and communicate with everyone, which I realize I can't do, and reaching the 80 or 90% who are going to get it. Mm -hmm. And every time I'm willing to leave behind the 10 or 20%, every time I can talk in a little bit of shorthand, every time that I can maybe just confuse a certain number of people a little, my writing gets better. Mm -hmm. And so I've got more diligent at pushing back on editors and more diligent at uh, being willing to let a few people need to read it twice as opposed to writing something twice as long that those guys will understand but other people will have been mm. bored by and moved away from. Mm. So you want your tribe, you'd rather have kind of a tribe of people who you, you know, really are on the same wavelength than potentially a slightly bigger tribe of people who you know, don't necessarily appreciate wh- where you're coming from in quite the same way. Is that fair to exactly. say? Exactly. I mean, if you look at almost every successful movement, every religion, every political movement, every brand and corporate movement, they always succeed by only talking to a few people. There are people who don't like Starbucks coffee. There are people who don't understand the book of Exodus. There are people who don't want to hear another speech by Gordon Brown. And that's all fine because the tribe itself will take care of itself and is big enough to sustain the leader. Uh, And where we fall apart, especially on the Internet, is by focusing on the trolls and by focusing on the one person out of 100 who says, uh, it's too complicated, I don't understand it. Brilliant. No, cheers to that, Seth. That's a, a really good understanding there. And, you know, I know that the new book's coming out in the new year and it's definitely, it, it's a good read and definitely worth people picking up. Well, thank you so much for your time. And um, I hope before the end of today, you will make the decision to do work that matters because there's a shortage of that. It's scarce and it's worth paying for. Brilliant. That's a great sum up there as well there on, on that one, Seth. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Brilliant interview there with Seth Godin. Next up, Tim Ferriss. Tell us a little bit about this interview with Tim Ferriss, uh, Kelvin. Well, I, I was really, really pleased when I was able to secure this um, interview. Tim Ferriss is um, mine and Dan's probably favourite. I don't like to use the word guru because it's got negative connotations, but um, he is. He wrote a book that we included in our best um, internet marketing books last year called The 4-Hour Workweek. And just before Christmas, he introduced a... It, 
expanded edition and a new version. And this isn't the kind of one where they just add a new introduction and you know put a new cover on it and charge you a couple more quid for a new copy. It's really expanded. And basically, the four-hour work week is a kind of marketing and business methodology where you can make your company and your business and your marketing more efficient, um, particularly with outsourcing. And um, you know, me, me, Dan, are big fans of the book. Um, but in the new version, um, what Tim's done is included a lot more case studies and tips to and links to tools of people who have read the first book and gone and done it and it's worked um so i talked to um tim about about how to go about outsourcing your life in that way and making yourself more efficient but you know really questioning him on how he tests marketing because that's something he's really really hot on so yeah another new york times bestseller um and a really good book that i can't recommend enough um and yeah he he was hugely friendly and um, gave away some of um, his tips on how he goes about testing marketing campaigns. Brilliant. Well, here we go. There is a a slight technical uh, difficulty we encountered halfway through, but we'll just jump in and quickly talk you around that one. But here we go. Tim Ferriss, enjoy. Um, One of my favourite areas of the 4-Hour Workweek book is the way you go about testing site performance and, you know, conversion rates and the like there. And it seems that that's something you've been particularly set successful with of your businesses that you've run thus far. What's some of your favourite tools that you use on a day-to-day basis to assess the performance of how well a site or a business is doing? So and a number of the tools that I use very commonly, uh, not only with the, the companies that I'm involved with on an operational basis, but also the companies that I work with, uh, as startups, uh, whether those are, are funded by Y Combinator or otherwise. So I work with about 12 companies, um, and some people are unaware that I'm an investor or advisor to companies like Twitter and Dig and StumbleUpon. Uh, would include uh, the, the standard stable would be Google Website Optimizer mm-hmm. for, for split testing, for yeah. testing A and, A and B versions yeah. of homepages and so forth. Uh, Crazy Egg. Uh, which is just crazyegg.com to look at click patterns and uh, to, to be able to filter by uh, referring sites, for example, to look at, just as one example, the click pattern differences between people coming from uh, google.de in Germany versus google.com. Uh, and uh, other, other uh, tools that I use that aren't directly related to Conversion rate would include uh, Product Planner. Mm-hmm. Uh, ProductPlanner.com, I believe that's the URL, yeah, was created by uh, Heaton Shaw, H I T E N S H A H, who's one of the better metrics guys in Silicon Valley, who I'm friends with, and uh, allows you to see the exact sign up flow for different popular sites that have put a lot of money into testing already. Right, Andy again here. We did have a slight technical problem at this point, didn't we, Kelvin? Yeah, um, anyone who's ever used Skype for an interview will know how easy it is to drop out. And at about this stage of the interview, unfortunately, with Tim, we dropped out for um, about 30 seconds or so, and I had to carry on recording using my iPhone rather than um, my super-duper Skype recorder. Okay, and I've done the best I can with the audio quality. It's just about listenable too, but we wanted to include it because the uh, the content is so good. So let's continue on. Enjoy some commonalities if you look at the 50 or so case studies in the book and just as a side note uh, people who are not in the US may have trouble getting the expanded Mm. edition one way around that is to go to audible a u d i b l e uh, for the audiobook and then if you have to specify country specifying USA (laughs) (laughs) so you didn't hear that from me but uh, (laughs) a nice little work around there yeah, that's one workaround. And there is a way to hack the Kindle as well. So if you have an international Kindle, I did tweet out a, a Kindle hack for international that you can play with. But um, the commonality, I think, which surprised me, actually, is that they all started very, very, very small. Uh, so one of the problems that people have is they try to completely reinvent everything that, that they are doing at the same time and it doesn't work very well or the potential loss or perceived loss is too high. So one of the issues that people fail with outsourcing, for example, is they'll immediately take some mission critical uh, business activity and send it to someone that they haven't 
uh, vetted properly or to someone that they haven't tested properly. So even to your listeners, I wouldn't suggest that the first thing they do with an outsourcing company or an outsourced uh, virtual assistant is have them do competitive research that you view as very important and as a mission critical step in doing your due diligence for an upcoming campaign. I would recommend they use it for something really ridiculously uh, mundane like uh, let's just say for holiday shopping uh, you know calling every toy store within uh, a 10 mile or you know 15 kilometer radius of your house to find the one hot toy of the season that you don't want to spend six hours trying to hunt down for (laughs) for Christmas or whatever it might be Uh, I I think that that is a better use it's less intimidating it allows you to get get comfortable using the tools or using the principles before you move on to things where there's an associated risk Mm. and what's your favorite case study thing because I really enjoyed the one um, recently on the blog about the the, you know the the baseball coach who was able to take you know something that was kind of a something they're really passionate on but it gave them the confidence to to go out and you know do that you know because some of those cases are great i mean does it, how pleasing is it to you to see these people have you know changed their life based on you know your your work really uh, it's it's hugely humbling and, and gratifying i mean it's it, what it's what it's what makes the blog worth the time uh, and and the attention that I that I give to it. Um, there's another example that's actually uh, not in the book, but will be up on the blog in the next uh, week or so uh, of, a, of an even smaller niche market that has been used. Um, so rather than the uh, baseball niche, which the, the swing mechanic Jamie used, uh, another another gentleman, actually a really young guy, uh, who. Uh, created a DVD called Gorilla Drum Making. That's Gorilla like Gorilla Warfare. Mm-hmm. And uh, he is showing people how to create a five piece drum kit using basic tools that are available at the, the Home Depot, which is a store here in the US, perhaps in some countries internationally, yeah. where you can get construction tools. Uh, and he tripled his income using this one DVD that shows people how to yeah. make five piece drum kits at home. So uh, it would be hard for me to imagine a niche audience that you would assume would be too small to sustain some mm-hmm. full time and this guy has tripled his income. So uh, that's another, I think, really fun example that demonstrates uh, how simple it can be. It does not have to be a complicated business using Basecamp and a million different split testing tools. He did test, yes, but he didn't even have split testing tools to my mm. knowledge. I mean, he would he would run one version for a week, yeah. run another version for a week, and compare them. Is that ideal? No, but is it better than nothing? Mm. Yeah, absolutely, it's much better. Do you think that's a mistake that some people do make, where they kind of overcomplicate the business idea or overcomplicate the marketing they're trying to do, when really they should just kind of keep it fairly simple? Uh, I think that's one of the fundamental <coughs> sins of, of building businesses or not building businesses mm-hmm. in the sense that I think that the, com- the complexity or the excuse of complexity is often used as a reason for not starting a company. So they'll say, oh, well, I do it, but I don't have any technical knowledge. I do it, but I don't know how to use split testing. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to even create a website. And the fact of the matter is, uh, you can be up and running on a site like Shopify.com or mm. uh, even using something like WordPress.com and then just throwing in uh, throwing in different e-commerce extensions. Mm. Uh, you can have a website up and running in about 15 minutes, uh, so it doesn't it doesn't need to be technically sophisticated in order to work mm. uh, at all. And that's certainly true when you realize that. Uh, even as recently as you know, five years ago, uh, or let's just say ten years ago, um, the split testing tools that exist now did not exist. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. What did those people do? They didn't have the option. Of, they, they managed okay, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they did. They did just fine uh, in many cases. So mm. I think that overcomplication uh, is is oftentimes uh, <coughs> the greatest source of paralysis for entrepreneurs who would otherwise do very well. Brilliant. Cheers. Well, thanks for that, Tim. You know, we're coming towards the end of the time there, and I'm conscious I don't want to take up um, too much of your time there, but really appreciate that. It seems to be doing quite well over here in the UK. I know when I was asking for it in our local bookstore, someone came up at the same time. He was looking for it on the shelves at the same time as well and had a bit of a chat. So that's, you know, fairly good sign that that, you know, 10 minute block when I was in there, there was someone buying at the same time. So hopefully it's doing quite well over here in the UK. And yeah, congratulations on how it's been going.
Well, that's it for this week's show. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Please visit the website at www.internetmarketingpodcast.org where you can see show notes, links and free subscription options to get new episodes delivered to your earbuds automatically. We'd love to hear from you, so if you have any questions or comments, please leave them on the website or send them to kelvin.newman at sitevisibility.com or feel free to send an MP3 audio file and we'll play it on the show. We'd also encourage you to leave ratings on iTunes. So this is Andy White signing off, wishing you the best until next time on Internet Marketing. Thank you.